Hi. In this video, I'm going to be dissecting Israel's favorite propaganda tactic, the weaponized anti-Semitism allegation. We'll be doing this by looking at a number of illustrative examples, including one from the YouTuber Knowing Better. Weaponized anti-Semitism allegations are one of the most common and most damaging tactics employed by pro-Israel, anti-Palestinianist propagandists. They employ this tactic because they know that they can't win by arguing the facts. They even say in their own propaganda guidebooks, which they have by the way, that it's very difficult for them to win there. So instead, the Zionist argumentative strategy if you can even really call it that, is to avoid actual arguments entirely. Instead, they make threats and accusations while feigning indignation. The way this works is that absolutely anything that could be taken as even slightly negative about Israel is immediately met with ham-fisted attempts to frame the one saying it and or the facts themselves as anti-Semitic. And despite the obvious ridiculousness of such allegations, they're still often given massive undue credence due to the fact that the Western mainstream media, political establishment, and society in general are all very pro-Israel, and thus very willing to spread such accusations far and wide while pretending to be outraged and acting like they're not totally absurd. So anyone expressing even the most milquetoast support for Palestinian liberation is often forced to walk on eggshells and be very careful to make sure they don't leave Zionist propagandists with any room to maliciously misinterpret them, lest they end up doxxed by a pro-Israel organization and get fired from their job. This has a massive chilling effect on advocacy for Palestinian liberation, which is exactly the aim. These weaponized anti-Semitism allegations are so common and feared that they're even given undue credence by some who claim to be pro-Palestine, who attempt to police the speech of others in the movement by the standards that have been designed by supporters of Israel themselves specifically to stifle criticism of Israel. Perhaps they're unaware of what they're doing, but regardless of their intent, the acceptable range of speech is narrowed to the point where people are prevented from denouncing Israel in terms that would normally be considered totally acceptable and not at all prejudiced in an analogous situation that did not involve Israel. Israel or Jewish people. The implications of this are, ironically, quite anti-Semitic. That there is some sort of essential quality to Jewishness that means that Israel and Israelis can't be held equally as accountable as others for the same actions. One example is this recent statement by US Congressman Richie Torres. The notion that Israel is committing genocide or ethnic cleansing is a blood libel. Blood libel there refers to a historical anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that Jews murder children to use their blood in satanic rituals. It is a dangerous lie intended to incite hatred for Israel as a Jewish state. The kind of hatred that has driven extremists to celebrate, call for, or commit violence against Jews. Falsely accusing the historical victims of genocide of committing genocide themselves is as despicable as the accusers. This tweet was posted during the height of Israel's 2023 Gaza bombing campaign. At the time of its posting, Israel had already murdered at least 10,000 people, including 4,000 children, in less than a month. Rather than attempting to refute the facts of the allegations of genocide and ethnic cleansing, Mr. Torres instead claims that even accusing Israel of carrying out such acts is by default anti-Semitic and thus should not be allowed. It is apparently simply impossible for Israel to ever do such things because it is a Jewish ethnostate, and Jews themselves have been victims of genocide and ethnic cleansing. So it doesn't matter what the facts and the evidence make clear, Jewish people could simply never ever do bad things to anyone else, and it's anti-Semitic to say otherwise. The funny thing is that this idea is pretty clearly anti-Semitic in of itself, because it requires one to believe that rather than just being normal people, there's some sort of magical innate ethnic quality that Jews have that makes them incapable of doing the same bad things as everyone else. It's an inversion of the more classic anti-Semitic idea that Jews have some sort of innate flaw that makes them malicious. It's also clearly just factually wrong as there's not even a serious debate as to whether or not Israel has carried out ethnic cleansing, even according to some of the most right-wing Israeli historians, like Benny Morris. And the term genocide is commonly used to describe atrocities that were less bloody than Israel's ongoing massacre of at least 12,000 people 
including 5,000 children, in just a month. Israel is also hardly the first example of a group of people who were oppressed going on to commit atrocities against another unrelated group of people. Two other examples are that many Irish people who had been colonized by the British Empire fled their homeland and ended up participating in the genocide of Native Americans, and that some former enslaved black people from the USA colonized Liberia, where they set themselves up as its ruling class and oppressed the locals for nearly two centuries. You or your ancestors having been oppressed does not mean that you are now suddenly genetically incapable of ever oppressing others yourself. I doubt that even the people making such ridiculous arguments honestly believe them. But well, as the Israeli propaganda guidebooks say, it is very difficult for us to win there with their meaning based on the facts. And so the facts must be ignored to instead make ridiculous accusations of anti-Semitism based on nothing more than the idea that it is literally impossible for Israel to ever do anything bad because it is the self-described Jewish state and Jewish people are apparently just magically innately good. This statement by a sitting US congressman is an absolutely textbook weaponized anti-Semitism allegation. Allegations like this, where Israel supporters make little to no effort to refute the specific facts being referenced to instead attempt to silence any mention of it via intimidation by branding anyone who dares talk about said facts as anti-Semitic, are very common. Another such example is the way in which Israel supporters tried to shout down any mention of the fact that Israel constantly massacres Palestinian children with accusations of anti-Semitic blood libel, such as this tweet by the National Director Emeritus of the Anti-Defamation League, Abraham Foxman, where he accused the New York Times of anti-Semitism for printing a cover with photos of Palestinian children who were, factually, murdered by Israel. The implication being that just because Jews historically have been slandered with false allegations of murdering children, that makes it anti-Semitic to denounce Israel for factually murdering children. An obviously ridiculous idea. Some other examples of this article on the American Jewish Committee website, which claims that it is an anti-Semitic blood libel to denounce the incontestable fact that Israel exports to the rest of the world repression techniques and technologies that it has tested and refined on Palestinians, including to the USA. Nothing about that is controversial. Leading pro-Israel organizations like the ADL openly run programs to send American cops to Israel to study so-called counter to terrorism strategies. The facts are inconvenient, but also irrefutable. So in response, they just scream anti-Semitism. This article also manages to shoehorn in a claim that it's blood libel to note the fact that Israel murders children. Because, you know, of course it does, they just can't help themselves. Another great one is this post on Twitter, which claims that it is an anti-Semitic, Nazi-esque libel for a Jewish organization to denounce the irrefutable fact that 100 Israeli doctors signed a letter that called for the IDF to bomb hospitals. Yeah. Of course, it is possible to abuse facts like these for anti-Semitic purposes. For example, if someone were to say that the reason that Israel carries out its atrocities against Palestinians is due to something innate to Jewish people, or blaming all Jewish people everywhere for the actions of the Israelis and their supporters, then that would clearly be anti-Semitic. Just as if such allegations were made about atrocities that happened to be carried out by some other ethnic or racial group. But that's clearly not the sort of thing that these people are claiming is anti-Semitic. Their aim is simply to brand any and all denouncements of Israel as motivated by nothing more than anti-Semitism, by just screaming it at the top of their lungs until it sticks. Their concern is not with anti-Semitism even slightly, it's solely with defending Israel by using the most underhanded tactics imaginable. Apart from being employed to help with the denial of inconvenient facts, weaponized anti-Semitism allegations are also used in pretty much any other way that you could possibly think of, and probably some that might not occur to you. For example, they're used to shut down pretty much all pro-Palestine, anti-Israel, political speech and action by insisting that it's anti-Semitic. For example, Indigo, Canada's largest retail bookstore chain is owned by Heather Reisman. Reisman runs a foundation that is dedicated to providing support to soldiers of the Israeli Defense Forces. Clearly, someone like this, an influential millionaire who materially backs the brutal occupation military of an apartheid state, is a completely valid target for a protest or boycott or whatever. Not if you ask pro-Israel propagandists though. According to them, 
targeting her for funding IDF soldiers at a time when said IDF soldiers are massacring scores of Palestinian children, no less, is a vile anti-Semitic hate crime, an indication that Jews in Canada are facing a wave of persecution. All context is removed to reduce an incredibly rich person doing what is essentially funding terrorism into little more than a poor, defenseless, vulnerable Jewish victim under attack for nothing more than her Jewish identity, and those who protest her actions and bring them to light as Nazi-style anti-Semites with no rational motivations aside from their hatred. It's a cynical, disgusting attempt to invoke imagery of the Holocaust to stifle criticism of a powerful person using her power to fund oppression. This sort of removal of context is always very deliberate, as the people involved in spreading such allegations tend to be supposed journalists and media types, whose job it is specifically to provide such context, so they know exactly what they're doing when they leave it out. Another very prominent example were the accusations levied against the Boston Mapping Project. This is one that I've wanted to talk about for quite a while now, because even lots of self-proclaimed pro-Palestine people fell for it. The Mapping Project is an online map of organizations and institutions, mainly in the Boston area of the USA, that support or collaborate with Israel. Something very useful for anyone from the area looking to boycott, protest, etc those who back the apartheid state. This was immediately painted as anti-Semitic by a wide chorus of pro-Israel organizations, most of which are pretty much entirely dedicated to weaponizing anti-Semitism allegations. The backlash was so strong that even the pro-Palestine boycott, divest, and sanction movement themselves denounced it. Yet if you actually look at the website, the vast majority of the organizations on the map are police departments who collaborate with the Israeli police and military, training together, and exchanging tactics of repression. Others are institutions like universities that collaborate with Israel, and weapons companies that support the Israeli military. So something like 95% of the organizations on this list, or even more, are very much not Jewish. But on this list, there is a small minority of Jewish-run or owned organizations that also support and collaborate with Israel. Organizations that are on this list not because they're Jewish, but because of said support for an oppressive apartheid state. The presence of this small minority of Jewish organizations was weaponized by a chorus of bad faith pro-Israel orgs to smear the mapping project as anti-Semitic. The message that they're sending with that is that if you happen to be Jewish, you can't be denounced protested or boycotted for supporting and collaborating with an apartheid state. A widely diffused example of this supposed anti-Semitism was this tweet, which claimed that the mapping project is anti-Semitic for listing a Jewish organization that helps the disabled called Yachad New England. But if you go to Yachad New England's website, it's really not hard to find that this organization organizes birthright Israel trips. As the name implies, these trips are based on the idea that being born into the Jewish ethnicity gives you a special right to live on colonized Palestinian land. They are designed to recruit Jews from around the world for a dystopian propaganda experience aimed at giving them free trips to Israel, directed towards convincing them to migrate there and participate in colonialism and apartheid themselves. On top of that, this organization also counts among its partners a couple of other organizations that are also listed on the mapping project, like Jewish Boston, which sounds like a pretty neutral Jewish organization, but in reality, it's actually a media organization that runs a website and social media accounts that are nearly entirely dedicated to disseminating pro-Israel propaganda. And the Ruderman Family Foundation, an organization run by Jay Ruderman, a former member of the IPAC pro-Israel lobbying group, and former IDF soldier who is a current board member of the local Friends of the IDF chapter. His organization's own website states that its purpose is to strengthen the relationship between Israel and American Jews because it considers American Jews to be a strategic asset for Israel. So basically, it's dedicated towards propagandizing towards American Jews to get them to support Israel. 
So, Yachad New England is an organization that actively recruits people to go and colonize Palestine, that lists among its partners other organizations that are very open and proud about their support for the Israeli apartheid state. Yet all of this context is removed, and it is instead presented as just a Jewish organization that helps disabled people. Thus, opposition to it, which is politically motivated, is instead manipulatively painted as anti-Semitic. This organization clearly aids and abets Israel, and so it absolutely belongs in a list of organizations that back and normalize the oppressive Israeli state. It being a Jewish organization should not and cannot immunize it from being held to account for this. And it certainly does not mean that anyone who denounces them for promoting Israeli colonialism and partnering with pro-Israel organizations is anti-Semitic. Any implication otherwise is obviously just fundamentally dishonest. A cynical attempt to weaponize anti-Semitism to defend Israel by stifling political action against it and the organizations that back it. This dishonest narrative that was peddled against the mapping project was spread so far and wide and backed by so many powerful organizations and people that it successfully pressured or misled large numbers of Palestine supporters into denouncing it as anti-Semitic themselves. Let us imagine an analogous situation. We're in 1975 and there's a white South African community organization that is a proud partner of numerous other local pro-apartheid organizations. This organization recruits disabled white people for trips to apartheid South Africa that paints it as a perfect country full of wonder with no oppression anywhere whatsoever and encourages them to move there to become a part of and strengthen the apartheid system themselves. Would it be anti-white racism to put that organization on a map of organizations that supported apartheid South Africa to call to boycott, protest, or disrupt those organizations? Obviously not. These last two examples are demonstrative of another facet of the weaponized anti-Semitism allegation. It is applied in an incredibly broad and sweeping fashion that goes far beyond any standard for what constitutes prejudice against any other group. For those who employ this tactic, anything that is at all related to Jewish people in any way can and should be framed as anti-Semitic provided that doing so is useful for pro-Israel purposes. A protest against an organization that recruits people to go and steal Palestinian land and homes for themselves can be spun into anti-Semitism because the organization happens to be Jewish. A protest against a businesswoman who personally funds the soldiers who murder Palestinian children is spun as anti-Semitism because she happens to be Jewish. Nothing is off limits to them. Nothing is sacred. No lie, no smear is ever too far, as long as it can be used to provide cover for Israeli atrocities and those who support them. I could go over countless other examples of the ridiculousness of these weaponized anti-Semitism allegations, but there's just way too many of them. They latch on to absolutely anything, and I mean anything, so it's really impossible to even come close to covering all the tricks they use in just one video. One more, though, is abusing the fact that there is a Star of David on the Israeli flag and also on the aircraft that they use to bomb Palestinian children with to cry anti-Semitism at anyone who then uses that symbol, which Israel chose for itself to make negative references towards Israel. And even when people take the necessary care to make sure not to solely depict the Star of David and include the rest of the Israeli flag along with it and make the colors correct and everything, they still accuse them of anti-Semitism. People have actually been fired from their jobs for holding signs depicting the Israeli flag being thrown into a trash can. It is ludicrous. You can never win with them because they're simply propagandists who are out to legitimize the oppression of the Palestinian people through any and all means. So it's best to not even try and to instead warn others about them and explain their methods and aims. And well, we've just gone over some of their methods. Now let's go over two of the most important aims of these weaponized anti-Semitism allegations, aside from the obvious one of just shutting down dissent as much as possible. The first aim is to spread the notion that Israel's opponents are only against it because they are anti-Semitic, rather than because of what Israel has done and does. 
This claim is especially weaponized against the Palestinians themselves, who are implied to be against Israel not because it has forced them out of their homes, repressed them under a brutal occupation, massacred their families, etc., but rather just because they're sort of innately anti-Semitic. If you think about this one for a second, you'll quickly realize that it implies that they would otherwise be okay with all of that stuff being done to them, as long as it was done by some other group aside from Jewish people. An obviously absurd idea. Nonetheless, this is an extremely common and blatantly racist implication that Zionists aim to spread as far and wide as possible. The second aim is to invert reality by framing Israel as somehow being the victim of Palestinians. The classic strategy of reverse victim and defender. Oppressors and aggressors love to claim that they have been forced into their actions by their victims, who, according to them, hold an irrational hatred of them that has nothing to do with their actions. Other European settler colonial projects have done much the same, framing themselves as the victims of their victims. One big example is the colonization of the USA, where white settlers engaged in pervasive self-victimization, removing the context, like the fact that they were the ones invading native lands and expelling and murdering native people, to portray native retaliation as barbaric and inexplicable, and themselves as victims of the natives. What is unique to the Israeli case is that such a narrative, regardless of how clearly untrue the actual evidence shows it to be, can be more pervasive to an outside audience as Israel is a Jewish ethnostate, and a lot of people, particularly in the West, have more sympathy for Jewish people because they were victims of the Nazi Holocaust in the not too distant past. So while Zionist propagandists utilize similar reality inverting narratives to other colonial projects, they differ in the fact that they use them much less to justify their crimes to themselves and much more, to cynically weaponize the historical oppression of Jews in order to emotionally manipulate said foreign audiences into excusing present-day Israeli crimes on the basis of their past oppression. The aim is to remove the context of Israel's ethnic cleansing, its occupation, its everyday atrocities, to frame Israelis as perpetual and permanent victims, who are either incapable of victimizing others, or whose victimization of others can be uniquely justified by their permanent victim status. And so the narrative goes that they have been tragically forced to defend themselves from the barbaric, innately anti-Semitic Palestinians to whom they have done nothing wrong. It is a cheap tactic of emotional manipulation that weaponizes historical Jewish oppression to deny and justify Israel's crimes. One that implies that it's okay to do pretty much whatever you want to anyone you want, provided that a completely unrelated group of people at some point in the past has done something bad to you, your ancestors, or even just people from the same in-group as you. None of this logic would ever be accepted in any other case, which makes it clear how flawed it is, and the people who employ it are mostly aware of that, but they don't care, because their aim is simply to stifle dissent against Israel in any possible way that they can, not to make anything resembling a logically sound or consistent argument. They want to immunize Israel and Israelis from the very same standards that everyone else is held to, while dehumanizing their victims as much as they can in the process, to justify more and more depressing actions against them. You can see elements of these aims very clearly in the examples that we just went over. And for the rest of this video, we're going to be going over this and exploring how these weaponized anti-Semitism allegations work in much more depth by refuting a long Twitter thread by the YouTuber Knowing Better. It's a bit more subtle and less based around just blatantly denying facts like the other examples, but it's still just as stupid and just as intentionally malicious. It's a really good way of exploring how the pro-Israel crowd reverse the victim and defender and frame Palestinian resistance to Israeli colonialism as being rooted in the Jewishness of Israel rather than in anti-colonialism. The thread begins with this tweet. People seem a bit confused as to why this is hate speech. We're quick to notice the dog whistles in right-wing memes, but never seem to notice it for our own side. So let's break it down. Well, okay, let's see what the man has to say. He continues. The key. The story goes that when Israel was first established, the Palestinians who were forced out of their homes kept their keys so they could eventually return. This doesn't symbolize freedom or peace, but retaking Palestine from the Jews. I'm not exaggerating at all when I say that this is probably the worst case of the weaponized anti-Semitism allegation that I have ever seen. Okay, so first some context. In 1948, in an event known as the Nakba, the vast majority of the Palestinian population, some 750,000, were forcibly expelled by Israel 
and never allowed to return to their homes. Their land was then handed over to Israeli settlers. Many of the victims of this ethnic cleansing kept the key to their homes, hoping to one day return, and this has become a powerful symbol of the Palestinian struggle for their right to return to their stolen land and homes. But knowing better reframes these people, who were clearly victims of Israel, as potential hypothetical perpetrators, while the Israelis who stole their homes and forcibly expelled them are reframed as their potential victims. Why? Well, because the victims haven't just laid down and given up their claims to the land and homes that the Israelis stole from them. They have kept the keys to their own homes anti-Semitically. I have never seen anything quite as blatantly stupid as this, and it's really a wonder to me how someone could write this and think they were making a good point. I think it should kind of go about saying, but I'll say it anyway. Victims of ethnic cleansing have every right to want their stolen lands and homes back. This notion is not controversial. It's even enshrined into international law via UN Resolution 194. I'm sure even knowing better would agree with this principle if it was framed more neutrally. For example, if we were to change Palestinians expelled from their homes should be allowed to return and reclaim them to people expelled from their homes should be allowed to return and reclaim them. But he's a Zionist, so he has to try and find a way to problematize this clearly unobjectionable idea solely in the case of Israel. And he tries that with this last line. This doesn't symbolize freedom or peace, but retaking Palestine from the Jews. This is more of the emotional manipulation that I'm talking about. Palestinians wanting their stolen land and homes back, which they still hold the keys and deeds to in many cases, magically becomes anti-Semitic because the thieves happen to be Jewish. The Palestinians completely rational, understandable, and morally righteous desire, which is also a legally enshrined right, which literally anyone else in the same situation would also want to exercise, becomes anti-Semitic. Because knowing better manipulatively reduces the people who stole the land from them and who have since kept them under a brutal occupation while periodically massacring them to just the Jews. It would be infinitely more accurate to say the Israelis or the Zionists, but the less precise the terminology that he uses, the more he can imply that the Palestinians are evil anti-Semites for the crime of wanting their homes back. He also makes a very conscious choice to say not just Jews, but THE Jews, intentionally using a phrasing which is commonly used by right-wing anti-Semites. Additionally, he uses the fact that Palestinians don't want to give up their legally enshrined right to get their own property back to frame them as the barrier to peace. This is a common trick played by the pro-Israel crowd, which is also more broadly applicable to other conflicts. The side that is blamed for preventing peace is not Israel, for refusing to give Palestinians their stolen land back. Rather, it is somehow the Palestinians who are blamed, because they refuse to agree to peace on Israel's terms, which are that they just give up and stop asserting their rights of what is theirs and just let Israel have everything. It's a clear as day pro-Israel framing. Palestinians are thus dehumanized to the point where they are framed as like evil anti-Semitic devils for something as simple and clearly righteous as wanting their stolen homes and land back. We're supposed to believe that that is not an entirely rational desire for them to have, but rather a vulgar manifestation of anti-Semitism. In order for that desire to be anti-Semitic, it would need to be driven specifically by a hatred of Jews, not by the same sort of rational response to colonial dispossession that literally anyone would have. For that to be the case, we would need to believe that Palestinians would not want this exact same right of return if the thieves had instead been from some other ethnic group. That they would just love it if like Russians or Albanians or Peruvians had stolen their houses. An obviously ridiculous idea and an incredibly racist one. As usual, the ones screaming anti-Semitism are themselves massive anti-Palestinianists. The only other possible interpretation is another one that we went over earlier. That Jews, due to historical oppression that they have faced, should be allowed to do things to others that would otherwise not be permissible. Thus, this is a special situation where wanting to get your soul and property back is morally reprehensible, but solely because the thieves happen to be Jewish.
This tweet is an amazing demonstration of everything that I just went over. The emotional manipulation achieved by bringing up the fact that those who stole these Palestinian land and homes happen to be Jewish, when this is entirely irrelevant to the motives of Palestinians for wanting the right of return to their own goddamn homes. The reversal of victim and defender, where victims of ethnic cleansing and subsequent occupation are framed as somehow being in the wrong, for claiming the right to return to their stolen land and homes. No logical argument is put forth for how on earth this can be the case, beyond an appeal to the Jewish identity of those who stole said land and homes. The framing of opposition to Israel, especially by Palestinians, as being driven by anti-Semitism, rather than being an entirely rational response to Israeli actions, to the ridiculous extent that something as basic as a Palestinian wanting his stolen home back is framed as a vile anti-Semitic act, just because those who stole it happen to be Jews. Keeping the keys to the house that you were expelled from is anti-Semitic. Wanting the land that was stolen from you back? That's anti-Semitic. I cannot emphasize enough how clearly and obviously stupid this is, how obvious it is that it is a cynical and disgusting attempt to invert reality for the purposes of legitimizing the crimes of Israel. And he tweeted this out while Israel was bombarding and massacring over 100 Palestinian children every single day. We are to believe that knowing better, who makes long and detailed videos with complicated arguments, genuinely failed to notice how dumb his argument was here. We are to believe that he genuinely believed that just appealing to the ethnicity of the Israelis was a good enough argument on its own, and that he did not mean to be intentionally manipulative and anti-Palestinian. No, I don't believe that for a second. This is who he is. He knew what he was doing here, and he did it on purpose. During an ongoing genocidal massacre in Gaza by Israelis, he chose to fearmonger about a hypothetical reverse genocide by the genocide victims, based on their absolutely abominable crime of keeping the keys to their own homes. I hope that this will be remembered. I hope that he will not be allowed to forget that as Israel was bombing Palestinian children, he chose to post blatant pro-Israel propaganda and attack the Palestinians for having the audacity to keep the keys to their own homes and cry out for their own liberation from the abominable atrocities of Israel. Okay, on to the next tweet in this thread. From the river to the sea is the first half of a slogan. The second half, curiously absent, is Palestine will be free. This is the most contentious line, but make no mistake. It is an anti-Semitic phrase. The Arab world has been clear on this from the start. The assertion that Palestinians claiming historic Palestine, which is what from the river to the sea clearly implies, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, is anti-Semitic, is a weird enough claim on its own. Asserting your people's right to their historic territory, that they've very nearly been entirely expelled from in living memory, would seem like a perfectly acceptable thing under normal circumstances. One could not imagine knowing better getting angry at Ukrainians for saying something similar, for example. But again, in this case, the perpetrators are slash were Jewish. Ergo, the implication being made is that the only reason that Palestinians would still cry out to reclaim their historic territory is because the people who took it from them happen to be Jewish. That, or that Jews have some sort of uniquely special right to violently seize land from others. Ridiculous, racist, anti-Semitic, and insulting to our intelligence. Even more ridiculous, though, is the implication that he makes there that the Palestine will be free part was left out intentionally, it was curiously absent according to him, clearly implying that it is some sort of nefarious phrase that is even worse than from the river to the sea already supposedly is. I'm really interested in how he can possibly rationalize that. How is Palestine being free like some sort of innately anti-Semitic idea? Well, let's see what evidence is going to show us. A quote from Hassan al-Banna of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1948. If the Jewish state becomes a fact, and this is realized by the Arab peoples, they will drive the Jews in their midst into the sea. You will notice that this quote just mentions the sea, nothing like from the river to the sea, nor Palestine will be free. That's because it's being mischaracterized. The quote is not about Palestine. It is rather an Egyptian who is threatening the expulsion of Jews from other Arab majority countries 
in retaliation for the partition of Palestine. So he also is not even Palestinian. So this is not even an example of the phrase actually being used. It's not even a quote from a Palestinian, and he's not even talking about expulsion from Palestine itself. So it is not an example of what knowing better is claiming it is. Nor would it really matter if it were, since you can't just quote one guy, to prove that a call for liberation used by millions upon millions of oppressed people is some sort of nefarious, anti-Semitic dog whistle. And regardless for that to be the case, we would still need to accept the absurd idea that Palestinians would not fight for their freedom or want to reclaim their homeland from the river to the sea just as much if they had been colonized by some other group aside from Jews. And the wider context of this interview can maybe shed some more light on this, even though again, the guy's not Palestinian. While the language used here to refer to Jews is very blunt and confronting, for anyone who's sensitive especially to European-style anti-Semitism, the fact of the matter is that the Zionist movement has always been an ethno-nationalist movement of Jews who claim to be the sole legitimate representatives of their people, to the extent that they have, from the very beginning, claim that non-Zionist Jews are not real Jews. So to refer to them simply as Jews, especially in this case before the formation of the State of Israel, is simply using the same terminology that they use for themselves. When Zionism and Israel equate themselves with Jewishness in general, it's hardly surprising that some victims and opponents of Zionism in Israel take them at their word, incorrect as that may be. And when they do, Israel is infinitely more to blame for that than the people who do so, since it's the party that is claiming to be committing atrocities in the name of an entire ethnicity. So while it is much more preferable to be more precise by using terms like Zionists or Israelis, saying Jews instead is not in of itself anti-Semitic, just as it would not have been in of itself anti-white for a Native American to have talked about their opposition to the white man forming a state on their land. Whether such speech is anti Semitic or not depends on broader context on the motivation behind it. And the interviewee spoke of his motivation for opposing the formation of a Jewish state in Palestine in the interview that this quote is from. We sympathize with the homeless Jews, he said, but it is not humane that they should be settled where they render homeless other people who have settled for thousands of years. So at least according to him, his opposition to the foundation of a Jewish state was not based on him being opposed to the idea of a Jewish state, but rather him thinking that it was wrong to break up Palestine and hand huge parts of it over to the settlers as this went against the wishes of the Palestinians who had been there for far longer and who would be displaced in the process. You can choose to take him at his word or not. I honestly don't really care about defending this guy's honor, since again, this is an Egyptian who is not even using the actual phrase, nor even referring to Palestine. And that alone already renders knowing better's usage of this quote as evidence here invalid. Rather, I'm using this as an opportunity to show that calling Jewish settlers in Palestine Jews, especially historically, and talking about retaliation against them cannot be taken as anti-Semitic by default. Unless you actually have some sort of evidence that this is motivated by their Jewishness, rather than them being part of an ethno supremacist project that was and still is colonizing Palestine at the expense of Palestinians. There is a clear difference between punching someone because you hate an essential facet of his identity and punching someone because he's stealing your home. And weaponized anti-Semitism allegations seek to convince people that solely in the case of Israel, there is no difference. There's a great article about this from the Palestinian perspective by Mohammed al-Kurd called Jewish Settlers Stole My House. It's not my fault they're Jewish. I'll link it in the description. Please do go and read it in full after you watch this video. Here's a long excerpt. Not only do we live in fear of displacement at the hands of a colonialism that professes itself as Jewish, not only are our people bombarded by an army that marches under what it claims is the Jewish flag, and not only do Israeli politicians over-enunciate the Jewishness of their operations, but we are told to disregard the Star of David soaring on their flag, the Star of David they carve into our skin. The Palestinian people have consistently made it crystal clear that our enemy is is the colonialist and racist ideology of Zionism, not Jews. Our capacity to produce such distinction is admirable, considering the heavy-handedness with which Zionism attempts to synonymize itself with Judaism. However, this distinction isn't our responsibility, and personally, 
it isn't my priority. A Palestinian's perceived resentment doesn't have the backing of a Knesset to codify it into law. Tropes aren't drones, nor can one convert conspiracy theories into nuclear weapons. We are past the early 1900s. Things are different. Power has shifted. Words are not murder. Here is where I stand. There is a Jew who lives, by force, in half of my home in Jerusalem, and he does so by divine decree. Many others reside, by force, in Palestinian houses, while their owners linger in refugee camps. It isn't my fault that they're Jewish. I have zero interest in memorizing or apologizing for centuries-old tropes created by Europeans or in giving semantics more heft than they warrant, chiefly when millions of us confront real, tangible oppression, living behind cement walls or under siege or in exile, and living with woes too expansive to summarize. I'm tired of the impulse to preemptively distance myself from something of which I am not guilty and particularly tired of the assumption that I'm inherently bigoted. I'm tired of the pearl-clutching pretense that should such animosity exist, its existence would be inexplicable and rootless. Most of all, I'm tired of the false equivalence between semantic violence and systemic violence. I'll never be a perfect victim. There's no escaping being accused of anti-Semitism. It's a losing battle, and more importantly, a glaring red herring. There are better things to do. We have coffins to carry. We have kin in Israeli mortuary chambers that we must bury. If you were born into a brutal occupation, forced to live under apartheid, and expelled from your home, while you were told incessantly by the people doing that to you, that they were doing it in the name of the Jewish people, then it wouldn't exactly be surprising if you took them at their word and you felt some animosity towards Jewish people. Just like it was not exactly surprising that some black South Africans during apartheid weren't exactly very fond of white people, or that slaves in Haiti evidently were not very fond of their white masters. It's a lot easier to see the nuances, to understand that Israel's claims to represent all Jews are bullshit, and to be more precise with the terminology that we use, when we're watching on from afar, and aren't the ones being told that we're going to be killed or imprisoned unless we leave our house to make way for a Jewish family, when we aren't the ones with family members being massacred in bi-yearly terror bombings by a country that openly calls itself the Jewish state with the Star of David on its flag. You cannot expect everyone who's had such circumstances forced upon them to be some perfect liberal humanist victim who holds no animosity against anyone. And really, no one honestly does. They just pretend to expect it when the victims are Palestinian. Knowing Better understands this perfectly well too. He made a video where he made that clear in the analogous context of Native Americans who attacked white settlers during the colonization of the USA. Pretty understandably, the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and several other Plains nations were no longer interested in calls for peace by the Americans, and began raiding wagon trains, cutting telegraph wires, and scalping settlers. Yes, I just said I understand why they scalped settlers. How could you not? Why is it that when we do it, it's an honest misunderstanding caused by a few bad apples, but when they do it, they're uncivilized, bloodthirsty savages? We were the ones killing women and children and making hats out of their body parts. Wouldn't you retaliate? He got why they did it. He understood that Native Americans did not hate settlers because they were white or any other essential facet of their identity. Rather, it was because of what the settlers had done to them, what they were doing to them. But apparently, we're to believe that he doesn't understand this in the case of Palestinians. I don't believe that, and I don't think anyone should. If you have a problem with the hatred that a criminal state like Israel is inevitably going to engender, which I hope you do, then you should be angry at Israel for causing it, rather than directing your anger at its victims for not being perfect enough, and conditioning your support for their liberation on them having to not hate their oppressors at all, and having to give up their claim to everything that has been taken from them. So the only actual clear anti-Semitism in the interview that Knowing Better cited here is in the fact that the interviewee held Jews of other nations responsible for the actions of the Zionist movement in Palestine. But again, threats of retaliatory ethnic cleansing of Jews from other places made by an Egyptian who was not actually using anything resembling the phrase in question does not constitute anything resembling adequate proof or even proof at all that the Palestinian phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is anti-Semitic. It's actually just wholly irrelevant. Let's move on to the next tweet now. Another quote. The war started and His Excellency then said that with 3,000 North African volunteers, we could throw them into the sea. 
Again, this is not a Palestinian, it's an Iraqi. All Arabs are not interchangeable. And it's not okay to cite two straight quotes from people who are not even Palestinians and act like they constitute some sort of smoking gun evidence of what Palestinians think. And again, this is not even an example of the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Nor even from the river to the sea. Again, only two words from said phrase are present. Is every single mention of the sea a dog whistle? It feels ridiculous that I'm even responding to these quotes, as even giving them that grace might give credence to the notion that these are even remotely valid pieces of evidence what knowing better is claiming. They're not. But still, whether this specific quote is anti-Semitic or not requires more context. Is throw them into the sea a literal threat or a euphemism for winning the war against them and taking back Palestinian land. And was he saying this because the settlers were Jewish, or because they had declared themselves as the exclusive owners of more than half of Palestine, and then expelled 750,000 Palestinians from that land? From this text alone, we can't form any sort of concrete idea as to what his motivations were either way. But the assumption that they had to have been anti-Semitic speaks to a double standard that is applied solely to Palestine, one that is inherent to the logic of the weaponized anti-Semitism allegation. Let's use some analogies to demonstrate this. If a Pole who was colonized and occupied by Germans during World War II said that he wanted to drive the Germans into the sea, no one would ever seriously argue that that guy was motivated by some sort of primordial anti-German hatred rather than just being against the invaders. If a Ukrainian living under Russian occupation said the same about Russians, no one would seriously argue that he were an anti-Russian racist Either. Nor would it be taken as a literal threat, rather than as a metaphor, for reclaiming stolen territory. Yet in the case of Palestine, the exact opposite is almost always assumed by default. This is a key part of the Western propaganda drive to frame Palestinians as irrational, innately anti-Semitic beast, denying them the ability to even feel any animosity towards their oppressors, framing their aspirations for liberation and restitution for the wrongs done to them as somehow evil, and exempting Israel from the same basic standards that others are held to. All of this on absolutely no basis aside from a vulgar appeal to the ethnicity of the Israelis. This is the same sort of dehumanizing logic used to justify colonialism throughout the centuries. They hate us because of something innate to us, rather than because of how we have wronged them. It is a genocidal logic, make no mistake, because if you can spin the cause of the hatred as not being due to the actions of the settlers, but rather something innate, then that means that no change of behavior by the settlers could possibly remedy it. Thus, they can much more easily justify solving the problem via extermination or expulsion. All of that's auxiliary to the argument that knowing better is making there though. Because an Iraqi using the words the sea in a sentence is not even close to being an example of the Palestinian usage of the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Let's move on to the next tweet now. Yasser Arafat began using the slogan around 1964 to advocate for a one-state solution. Hamas was founded that same year and immediately adopted the phrase, they openly want to obliterate Israel. This is simply not true. Hamas was founded in the late 1980s during the first Intifada. Knowing better seems to have moved this up a couple of decades for the purpose of trying to delegitimize the phrase by claiming that it was used by Hamas from the very beginning. It just wasn't, though. Also, Hamas does not openly want to obliterate Israel. Their position on Israel is actually a huge concession. It sucks ass, if you ask me. They accept the two-state solution along 1967 lines, which, from the Palestinian point of view, is actually a massive concession that hands Israel the vast, vast majority of their country. The only land that Palestinians would get back from such a deal is some of the West Bank settlements that Israel has colonized since. Nonetheless, even if they did want to openly obliterate Israel, aside from knowing better's intentionally loaded usage of the term obliterate there instead of something like abolish or dismantle, that's hardly anti-Semitic by default, not even close. Because from the Palestinian point of view, and also the point of view of really any remotely decent person who can acknowledge reality, Israel is an illegitimate state, an ethno-nationalist occupier that has colonized and stolen their land, expelling them from it on the basis of their ethnicity. A state is not the people who live within its borders. Abolishing it does not mean that magically everyone who lives there just ceases to exist. Abolishing it means getting rid of it and its bureaucratic apparatuses 
and replacing them with new ones. It does not imply doing anything at all to the people who live there. Nor does wanting to abolish Israel imply at all that the motivation for wanting to do so is because it is Jewish rather than the facts on the ground where it occupies Palestinian land and brutally oppresses Palestinians. Again, unless you believe that the Palestinians who want to abolish Israel would want to abolish it less if the people who had usurped their land and treated them like animals for seven decades were Puerto Ricans or whatever other group of people instead of Jews, then the allegations of anti-Semitism are simply nonsensical. To immediately jump to anti-Semitism allegations is manipulative and dishonest, an indication that you have no other means of justifying why the oppressive ethno-nationalist settler state of Israel that you like so much should be allowed to exist on any basis aside from just a cheap appeal to the ethnic identity of the Israelis and implying that it is somehow special. Think for two seconds about what Israel is and what it has always been from the very beginning, from even before it was founded. A state based on ethnic supremacy, ethnic exclusion, ethnic dispossession, and apartheid, to which these characteristics have always been core to it. Without that, Israel is no longer Israel. They've also only gotten worse over time. So why exactly is it wrong to be against the existence of such a state? And how is it possibly anti-Semitic to be against it, when this opposition is obviously based on those characteristics, and not the fact that it just so happens to be majority Jewish? It's obviously not. Insinuations like this are no different than it would have been to say that Rhodesia or apartheid South Africa have a right to exist, and that being against their existence made you anti-white. The only difference is that Israel is a Jewish apartheid settler state rather than a white one. The notion that that makes it any more or less legitimate is clearly just racist, as well as dehumanizing to Israel's Palestinian victims, since it implies that their oppression is somehow more righteous. The crux of the weaponized anti-Semitism allegation is the irrational, illogical, cynical, and manipulative implication that every horrid thing about Israel is magically acceptable solely in the case of Israel. So it is thus anti-Semitic to be against this state in any way, shape, or form. Okay, next tweet. Arafat may have wanted it to mean one thing, but it was co-opted almost immediately. Arguing otherwise is like arguing the swastika is a Hindu symbol. Yet many on the left seem to believe exactly that, and desperately want to convince you as well. No, it wasn't co-opted almost immediately, you made that up. But anyway, this is another instance of the Israeli propaganda tactic of the reversal of the victim and the offender. Palestinians, the victims of colonialism, are put into the shoes of the ultimate perpetrators of evil, who were also colonizers themselves of Eastern Europe, the Nazis, via the equation of the Palestinian call for freedom from Israeli oppression and for the return of land that they were ethnically cleansed from in living memory with the Nazi swastika. This is a clear absurdity because if there is a comparison to be made here with the Nazi project of racial supremacist, ethno-nationalist colonialism, it is obviously with the Israelis, who are the perpetrators of their own project of ethno-nationalist, racial supremacist colonialism, not with the Palestinians who are the victims of it. If you're seeing a pattern in this Twitter thread of absurd claims that fall down immediately if you think about them for like a second or two, that's not a coincidence. Because a big part of the weaponized anti-Semitism allegation is rote repetition. There is a veritable industry of organizations designed to look respectable and credible whose main purpose is to abuse their faux aura of respectability to accuse every anti-Israel thing that they see of being anti-Semitic. These allegations, no matter how dumb they obviously are, are then heavily boosted by celebrities, influencers, media personalities, and others who have big audiences on social media, like Knowing Better. They are also often spread by, and sometimes originate from, the compliant, pro-Israel mainstream media. When there is such an overwhelming chorus of well-funded propaganda organizations, media outlets, and people with massive social media followings, making repetitive allegations that obviously not anti-Semitic things are somehow anti-Semitic, a thousand times a day, this has a great effect on the public perception of what constitutes anti-Semitism. Eventually, some of them stick, and there's so many of them that are being thrown out, that this broadens the definition more and more and more every single day slowly but surely. Eventually, Palestinian existence itself is going to be branded anti-Semitic. That's if it hasn't already been. Because Palestinians having the key to their own house as anti-Semitic is damn near close to that. Palestinians are so universally degraded, so universally dehumanized, that it's possible for someone like this to frame them as the bad guys, as the Nazis, for wanting to return to their own homes. While we're here, 
I might as well mention that there's another common type of weaponized anti-Semitism allegation related to this tweet, that comparing Israel to the Nazis is anti-Semitic solely because the Nazis genocided Jews and Israel is a Jewish ethnostate. Curiously though, a lot of the same people who make this accusation have no problems with comparisons of Russia to the Nazis, despite the fact that the genocide of Russians was also a core part of Nazi ideology and practice. It's only claimed to be impermissible when it's inconvenient for Israel. Wow, what a surprise. The real motivation behind this claim is not genuine offense at supposed anti-Semitism, obviously. It's rather a desire to immunize Israel from being compared to the reference point for evil in the Western world. They want to deny their victims the ability to make such a powerful and widely understood comparison. Israel is a fanatical racial supremacist ethnostate carrying out settler colonialism, just as Nazi Germany was. So even if the level of severity is not the same, the comparison between them is apt. Because when it comes to comparisons with the Nazis, the level of severity is very rarely anything resembling the same anyway. My advice to Israel and its supporters would be that if you don't like being compared to the Nazis, maybe you should just stop doing Nazi stuff. And if you want more evidence that they don't actually care about anti-Semitism, beyond their ability to cynically weaponize it, the same sorts of Zionists who weaponize anti-Semitism allegations have recently started rehabilitating the Nazis as caring humans who genuinely thought that what they were doing was for the common good in order to argue that the Holocaust wasn't actually that bad to make Palestinians seem worse by comparison, to frame them as the ultimate animalistic monsters who hate for the sake of hatred and against whom any action is therefore justified. Those are Nazi levels of dehumanization of their victims. They care about absolutely nothing aside from saying whatever they think best serves Israel in the present moment. No matter how ridiculous it is, and no matter how clearly actually anti-Semitic it is. Not even Holocaust revisionism is too much for them. Let's move on to the next tweet in the thread now. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, means pushing the Jews into the sea and erasing Israel from the map. Palestine can't control that land if Israel does. Thinking that this conflict will end with one state where everyone lives peacefully is delusional. Knowing better might think that he's provided enough evidence to substantiate his assertion that Palestinians asserting their claim over Palestine stems from their innate anti-Semitism, but he obviously hasn't. This is a completely empty statement backed up by absolutely nothing aside from his word, and two quotes from non-Palestinians where the phrase was not used, each from 70 years ago at that. So Palestinians are dehumanized again. He denies them the right to have any context, to have any history, that might explain why they actually claim this land and why they actually want it back. He instead implies that they don't want their land and homes back for any actual rational reason, like because it's their land and homes and they want to live there. Instead, well, they're just kind of anti-Semitic. That's what drives them. He asserts that Palestine cannot control that land if Israel does. They want to wipe Israel from the map. I refer back to what I said earlier about what Israel actually means, what it is. He makes no actual argument for why it would be a bad thing to abolish the ethno-nationalist apartheid state of Israel that has, for the entirety of its existence, massacred people and kept the survivors in chains for the benefit of the Jewish-Israeli population. We are supposed to just take it for granted that the existence of this vile terrorist state is something worth upholding and protecting, and that this means that anyone Anyone who wants to abolish it is automatically some sort of horrible villain, especially if they're Palestinian. This is no different to exclaiming, oh my god, they want to abolish Rhodesia, and expecting everyone around you to feel horrified rather than cheer. To see the words free Palestine at a time when Israel is killing more than a hundred Palestinian children per day and say, um, actually, freeing Palestine would be genocide is the most vile reversal of victim and offender imaginable. An inversion of both presently existing reality and the entire history of the Israeli colonization of Palestine, where Israel has always been the one that has planned to and actually carried out ethnic cleansing and genocide against Palestinians, not the other way around. It also betrays a complete lack of imagination, since he presents as if it's completely logical the idea that the abolition of the ethno-supremacist state of Israel and its replacement with one Palestinian state could only mean killing everyone in Israel, rather than a single secular state with equal rights for everyone and the right of return for Palestinians who were ethnically cleansed from their homes. Israel and Palestine are really already functionally one state under Israeli rule anyway. It already exists as one apartheid state, 
but it couldn't possibly exist as one non-apartheid state. This idea that he's putting forth here, that the oppressed want to commit reverse genocide, has been used throughout history to justify the continuation of oppression. One prominent example is the way that southern slave owners in the USA argued against the abolition of slavery with the idea that their black enslaved people would commit a reverse genocide if they were freed. Assuming that Palestinians are like innately anti-Semitic, and cannot be trusted with their own freedom, is just as racist as the sentiments of those 19th century slave owners were. And just a short aside on his last comment regarding the one-state solution, I don't want to get too far off the topic of this video by explaining how a one-state solution would actually work, just to counter his offhanded, one-liner discounting of the idea. All I'll say is that if you think there's presently too much hatred for a one-state solution to be rushed into at this present moment, then it makes no sense for you to focus on the supposed hatred of the Palestinians towards their oppressors as the main barrier to it. Whatever Palestinian hatred of Israelis there is that currently exists is caused by the actions of the Israelis. The way to combat it is to make Israel change its behavior, not to focus instead on tut-tutting at their Palestinian victims. To demand that Palestinians love Israelis before they're allowed freedom is like demanding that a slave love his master before he can be released. It's putting all the onus on the victim, yet again. Reconciliation can only begin from the Israeli side, but people like knowing better assert the exact opposite, even though it's self-evidently ridiculous. They can only get away with this because of how normalized support is for Israel in Western society. So mercifully, we've finally arrived at the last tweet in this thread. Let's check it out. Just in his addendum, while Palestine will never die doesn't have any hidden meaning, it gives off real the South will rise again vibes. All that said, I support Israel's existence but what they're doing, and have been doing for decades, is wrong. So, Palestinians, who assert in the face of the Israelis, who would very much like for them to not exist, that they will never die, that's just like racist Americans who want to bring back the Confederate slave state. Why? Well, because he feels bad vibes, of course. They're clearly refusing to die anti-Semitically. Again, like with the Nazi comparison, reality is reversed, with Palestinians being compared to an example of a historical oppressor state rather than the Israelis. But the reality is that in the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians, the Israelis are the ones who are comparable to the Confederates and the Nazis and the Palestinians to their victims. Then, after having already done pretty much everything that he possibly could to delegitimize Palestinian liberation and attack Palestinians while bombs simultaneously rain down upon them, he has the audacity to claim that he's against Israel's actions over the last few decades, but not without first asserting that he supports Israel's right to exist. He can't just announce the suffering that Israel causes the Palestinians, no, no, no. He has to include a clarification that the cause of them the Israeli ethno-nationalist project should continue. Not just that it should continue, but that it has a right to continue. That just makes it even worse. He knows precisely what Israel does to Palestinians, knows how horrible it is, yet he nonetheless chose to target their cry for liberation, their assertion that they won't die, and chose to accuse them of being anti-Semitic. An accusation that legitimizes the very Israeli actions that are taken against them that he claims to be against. Once he started getting pushback to this thread, he posted another tweet. You can both think that what Israel is doing and has been doing for decades is abhorrent, and that a phrase is anti-Semitic. The world is not black and white. No, you can't. You factually can't be against what Israel does to Palestinians while also trying hard to legitimize it by painting their desire for liberation, their desire to return to their own homes as some sort of evil anti-Semitic dog whistle. He painted Palestinian phrases and symbols that assert the most basic of rights that literally anyone else in their same situation would also assert exactly the same as anti-Semitism. That's really not very far from asserting that their very existence is anti-Semitic. The point of all this is not honest concern about that phrase or really anything at all. It is a blatantly cynical political play. This sort of rhetoric, this sort of weaponization of anti-Semitism, its purpose is to scare activists and Palestinians into only using Israel-approved language and to draw attention away from the Israeli colonization of the Palestinians that is at the root of all these problems. If they were to use another phrase, then Israel and its supporters would condemn that phrase too, because it's not the phrase that they object to. It's the support of Palestine. Things are actually extremely black and white here. There is no nuance, there is no both sides. There is an ethnically cleansed population that is subject to occupation, 
apartheid and frequent mass murder and the state imposing that upon them. But the guy knew that. They always know it. Never believe that the Zionists are unaware of the absurdity of their propaganda. They delight in acting in bad faith, since they seek not to persuade by sound argument, but rather to intimidate. And in the propaganda sphere, the weaponized anti-Semitism allegation is their primary means of intimidation. Up is down, left is right. If there has ever been something that can rightfully be described as Orwellian, it is the Israeli inversion of clearly observable reality. I've wanted to make a video like this for a pretty long time, but I never really got around to it. I don't think it's really structured in the best way that it possibly could have been, since a huge part of it was obviously responding point by point to a Twitter thread. Perhaps it would have been more ideal to do it in another way, but nonetheless, I think I still managed to cover all the key points that I wanted to, albeit perhaps not in the most organized fashion. Part of the reason why it took so long for me to get around to making this video is because making a video about this topic is inevitably going to result in backlash from the exact same bad faith people that I'm talking about here. And I honestly just didn't really feel like dealing with it. But with everything that's been going on lately, I don't think that now is the time to let them intimidate us into self-censorship. I'm surely going to be myself branded as anti-Semitic for making this video. That is inevitable. It's simply all that Zionists are capable of doing when they're faced with something that's inconvenient for Israel, because, you know, the facts aren't on their side. My words will be twisted in the worst way possible by the worst people with the worst intentions. If I could guess which part in particular some of these people are going to try to use against me, it would be the bit where I made the distinction about wanting to push invaders into the sea because of their ethnicity versus because of them just being invaders. Nonetheless, it was an important point to make, since the intent is what makes an action anti-Semitic. Not just that the subject of it happens to be Jewish. Regardless of how much pro-Israel propagandists try to change reality and insist otherwise. Unlike those who weaponize anti-Semitism allegations, I actually think that Jewish people are just normal people, the same as everyone else, and don't need to be coddled and condescended to by the implication that they need some sort of special standard applied solely to them, that they should uniquely be allowed to oppress others. Palestinians are constantly opportunistically branded as anti-Semitic for no real logical reason aside from having been colonized by people who happen to be Jewish. Because of that, their simple desire for freedom and restitution and their resistance actions are framed as motivated by little more than a primordial racial hatred. When this would all obviously be exactly the same, regardless of the ethnic identity of their colonizers. So it's important for us to challenge this by explaining exactly that, and not to let these propagandists win by lying down and conceding to their comically broad definition of anti-Semitism and their bad faith use of it. Things that would otherwise not be considered racist or prejudiced when directed towards other groups cannot so simply be considered so in every single instance when directed towards Israelis, just because that's convenient for pro-Israel propaganda. If we leave them to expand the definition of anti-Semitism far beyond any other form of discrimination without pushing back, we are letting those who support Israeli oppression win. If we don't do something about this, we at least don't call out how ridiculous this is and add our voice to the chorus rather than just being cowards. If we all just say scared to speak up lest we face the consequences that speaking up often entails on this, then they'll be allowed to just keep expanding the definition to the point that merely existing as a Palestinian is going to come to be widely considered anti-Semitic, which is precisely what they'd like. Taking this stand will, no doubt, come at a personal cost to some of us, as there is simply no riskier political position in the Western world than being openly and unashamedly pro-Palestine, and refusing to abide by the standards for acceptable advocacy set by groups that hate Palestinians. But the more of us who do it, the harder it will be for them to keep going after us. I hope this video has equipped you with a better understanding of how weaponized anti-Semitism allegations work, so that you can better recognize them, combat them, and inform others of how to do so as well. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, and Palestine will never die. Does that make some of you uncomfortable? Good. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, then make sure to subscribe to my channel for more. And if you really liked it, then consider supporting me on Patreon or Ko-fi. Now I'd just like to thank all my patrons, and especially my $25 plus patrons. Jell Cripson, Mischief and Fins, Brosnan, Ace Malad, William Tomlinson, Arthur Simak Jones, Robokami, Exos, Stefan Jordan, Qualia, Mlog, Jacob Tran, Wrong Wing, and my $10 plus patrons. Wesley Potts, JG, Leaf Fiorine, Christian Corniels, Melissa Gomez, Can't Care Less, XXXX, Justin Bailey 77, Empire in Focus, Ugopnik, 
Nibiru, B, Theokatsaros, Johnny Rocket, Firefox 42, Happy Nephron, Minijan, Eric Perkins, Ant, Max Halland, Ting Ting, Jack Paul, Milton Friedman, So Splendid, Big Man, Shauna, Kieran Goodwin, Stefan, Megan Lowndes, Soyborn, Comrade Nabule, Clement Fudge, Hector Obregon, and Diego Abraham. That's all. See you next time.